message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Southern California Gas Company, California Resources Corporation, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Scott. We'd love to have you join our show today, and the way you do that is to give us a call. If you have a math problem you'd like us to solve, you can call us if you're here in Bakersfield. The number is 636-4357. If you're in San Luis Obispo, we'd love to give you a call, or have you give us a call as well. The number is toll free, it's 866-636-6284. You can even email us a math question that you have, do the math at kern.org. You can watch the show online, of course, do the math online.net and if you have any type of social media you can find us there as well we are on facebook instagram twitter and youtube we can call Central we can call them County, as well. yeah. right yeah perhaps make a uh, reservation for amelia you can bring us over and treat us for the afternoon that'd be kind of nice as long as i get some doc's ice cream ah uh, yes nice. that is indeed what's going to happen because every time we go over and uh, visit some schools we always have a lovely meal and then we top it off most often with yeah. docs Mm -mm -mm. That's yeah. some good stuff right there. Speaking of good stuff, we've got a lot of good stuff planned for today. We do, yeah. Uh, we'll get to the food items in just a little bit. Right. But we do have phone tutors available until 5.30, as we do most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. We have a very special guest in studio. We'll go out and about with Mary Lou. But before we do any of that, let's first take a look at today's Math in the News. And today's Math in the News has to do with food. Food. Good so, deal. Let's take a look at the board right there. And uh, you know what that is? Ice cream. Yeah, it would be nice if it was ice cream. <laughs> but it's not ice cream. It is indeed mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. You a right. fan of the, the mayo? It's a, I, I'm a big fan of the mayo, just not solo, right? you got to have it on something and then, you know, <laughs> I can't imagine yeah, not just by a the spoonful of mayonnaise. Not so much. You know, and I would say I am a 99% non-fan yeah. Of the mayo. Okay. I mean, there are some places that make some coleslaw or something, you know, and a little right. cup of maybe, you Gotta know. Got to make the sacrifice. Puckett's macaroni salad's got a little, but other than that, <laughs> keep the mayo out. All right. So I found a story, and uh, let me read this to you first. So All Michigan right. State University has more than 50,000 students enrolled at any given semester. And they have bulk food deliveries, as you can imagine, as yeah. any university would, distributed to the campus dining halls. In 2016, the university received 500 two and a half gallon tubs of mayonnaise. All right. Now, the student diners immediately noticed that something was not well. Something was not good with this. Uh oh. All right. The mayo had frozen and then thawed. Okay. Okay, but they're still serving it. Uh oh. Okay. Now, that's about 10,000 pounds of mayonnaise. So, what they did is they turned it into electricity. All right, now I'm right, really intrigued. intrigued. How does now, this right? happen? See, which is exactly why I you know, figured, all right, we need to do something with this yeah, and bring we do. some meth into it, all right? Luckily, in 2013, the school had opened up an anaerobic digester, a sealed tank deprived of oxygen in which organic waste is degraded at an elevated temperature, allowing certain types, certain types of waste material to decompose quickly and produce methane that can be captured and used as fuel. Okay. All right, so they had this already on campus. Yeah. All right, so let's fast forward to this photo right here. All right, so Whoa. they've got 10,000 pounds of mayonnaise. Yeah. Now, mayonnaise is essentially egg yolks and cooking oil. Very high fat content. Right. All right, 
and a great meal for the bacteria in the digester to feed on. Okay. So they had 12 employees spend an entire day dumping container after container into this anaerobic digester to yeah. turn this into electricity. Can you just imagine the aroma? I can only imagine. I don't even want to think about it. Because I mean, the, just imagine the mayo rotten by itself. Right. And then you've got all of this other lovely stuff oh, going in man. there. Spend an entire eight hour day just dumping that. Yeah. And I'm sure some of it splatters. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a hazmat suit or there? do you have a yeah. mayo suit on? That's the question. So I'm just, I mean, so it was a good thing that yeah. they had that, you know, to be able to dispose of that 10,000 pounds of mayo. Right. So. All right, other than the number 10,000, how are we going to tie some math into this? Well, um, you need to know your pints, quarts, cups, right. gallons, and all those types of there things. There you go, okay. So a lot of kids see these, uh, you know, in elementary school to learn all of the different measurements. And you know that you've got two cups in a pint, right? Yep. So you've got two pints in a quart, you've got four quarts in a gallon. And, I like that and, picture. Uh, That's a good one. Yeah. So those are little things, and then uh, a lot of times they're like, all right, well, make sure you mind your P's and Q's. Oh, that there saying. you go. All right. And that saying was, make sure you mind your P's and Q's, knowing the difference between pints and quarts. Okay. That so makes if sense. you're delivering something, which should be a pint or a quart, you need to mind your P's and Q's. All right. And that is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530 this afternoon. We have a very special guest in studio. Dylan, how are you? Good. You ready to roll? Yes. All right. Why don't you let everybody know where you go to school and what grade you're in? I'm in fifth grade and I go to Stockdale Elementary. Home of the stars, right? And how long have you been there? Six years. So you've been there since kindergarten? Yep. You like it pretty well? Yeah. And it's alright, not too bad. Huh? If you could fix one thing at Stockdale, what would it be? Nothing. Soda in the drinking fountains. Isn't that what you said? Put soda in the drinking fountains. Wouldn't that be great? That is true. There we go. Okay, so at least we have some suggestion for the principal. Alright, now <laughs> What soda would you put in? Oh, there you go. Mm. Good question. I'd probably put like where you can put push different buttons and they'd oh, all. Oh, so yeah. you know, now we have a selection. suicide thing, right? Yeah. You know, put all the different things in there. All right. right. Well, you know what? Maybe uh, you can have an opportunity. We'll send you to a restaurant. <laughs> you can go make one of those. All right. Six three six four three five seven is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available, and what we're going to do right now is we're going to go to the phones right now because we are going to get ready for our first phone call of the afternoon. Are you ready? We'll yeah. find out what the uh, student is up to. All right, Karina, is this who's on the line? Hello, Karina. Yeah. Hi. How are you today? Good. All right, as soon as you're ready, let's hear the math problem that you're working on. Okay. Henry, Janet, and Clark are playing a card game. The object of the game is to finish with the most points. The scores at the end of the game are Henry with negative seven, Janet with zero, and Clark with negative five. Who won the game? Who came in last place? Use a number line model and explain how you arrived at your answer. Oh, wonderful. All right, Karina, did, you, did I hear you right? You said we're going to use a number line. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so I'll get a number line ready to go. And maybe you can tell me about what range we should have on our number line. In other words, what is the smallest number we should have on the number line and what is the biggest number we should have on the number line? Um, you could have... Um, if you go all the way from like negative 10 and 10. Oh, I like that. That's wonderful. Now, how'd you pick negative 10? That's a great choice because it's not negative 7. We went all the way down to negative 10. Good choice. How'd you pick that? Because um, I don't want to go too close to 7 because I might run out of room. That's a good and, point. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm currently making a number line. I'm going to run out of room here in a minute. But it's okay because we have a neat little eraser here, so we'll make our number line a little bit bigger. And you said you wanted to go all the way to positive 10? Yes. Okay, so that's going to be a pretty long one here. So I'm at negative 1 here, and I'm going to get a 0. Now, how did you choose positive 10 to be the ending point of your number line? Well, my teacher always said we had to do the opposite. Uh, okay. Of them too. Good choice. I'm not going to quite make it. I'm going to make it to 8, but on your paper, if you can make it to 10, that's probably a good choice. Okay, so we have a number line now created from negative 10 to positive 10. Uh, I'm a little bit short, but I think we're gonna be okay there. 
And what's the next strategy that you would use to figure out where these numbers fall on the number line? You want to just put a dot there, is that okay? Yes. Okay, sounds good. So what's the first one you want to put on the number line? Um, zero. Zero, okay, that's a pretty easy one to find. And we'll just put a big old dot right there at zero. Now, which person in the game scored zero points? What was the name there? Janice. Janice, okay. Okay, which one do you want to put on the number line next? Negative five. Negative five. Okay, I'm going to go over here to negative five. I'll put a dot there. Which person in the game scored negative five? Um, Clark. Clark, okay. And we have one more score. What was the last score that we have to put on the number line? Negative seven. Negative seven. seven. Right, so I'm going to put a big old dot at negative seven. And who was that person? Henry. Henry, is that right? Henry, yes. Okay. So, I hope that you're following along here, either watching the show or making your own number line. But as soon as you can see the number line and see where everyone lands on the number line, you probably can answer those questions that you have. What was the first question that we need to answer in this problem? Who won the game? Who won the game? So, from the number line, who has the highest score? Janet. That's it. Zero. Yeah, she got, she's number one. Go, Janice. Number one. With zero points, it didn't happen very often, but apparently this is a game where zero points will make you the winner. What's the next question you have? Then who came in last place? Who came in last place? All right, so who's last place on our, on our number line? Henry. Henry, okay. Sorry, Henry, you got last, man. <laughs> Any other questions we have to answer about this problem? Um, no, only just to um, use a number line model and explain how you arrived at your answer. Ah, gotcha. So we have this number line. I'm going to ask you one more question. Are you ready for this? Janice okay. was the winner of the game, right? Here's yeah. my question for you. How much did she win by? She beat Clark, right? Clark's in second yeah. place. How much did she win by? Um, seven? Oh, she beat or Henry five. by seven. I agree with you there. But what about Clark? How much did she beat Clark by? Five. Five, there you go. And all you gotta do is you can either count on that number line, just hop two, three, four, five, or you can do a little math as well. But that's right, Janice won by five points, so she had a little bit of leeway, but even with zero points, apparently in the game they were playing, she is the winner. I'm glad you called in with that question, thank you. Nicely okay. done, and congratulations, Karina, for a lovely call right there. We're gonna send you a free pizza, courtesy of our friends at Cubby's, Chicago-style pizza, so congratulations on that. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We've got Dylan in studio, but right now we're going to go out and about with Mary Lou. Do you ever wonder how speed limits are determined on a street or where signals are placed. Well, today we are at the Public Works Traffic Division and I'm with Ed Murphy, Civil Engineer 3. How Hello. are you doing? Doing wonderful. Can Welcome. you quickly tell everybody exactly what it is that you do here? We are in charge of pretty much all things traffic in the city. Uh, we have two divisions, one's in planning and development, and one's in operations. I'm in charge of operations. That's handling signal timing, striping on the roadways, everything that the cars are using while they're out there, cars, vehicles, uh, bicycles, and pedestrians uh, out there on the roadway. And then there's the planning division, which uh, develops future streets and future projects and things like that. So, Can you tell us where we are right now? We are right now in our office here at City Hall in the Public Works Traffic Division. There's eight of us on staff here, uh, about half of us for operations, half of us for planning. And uh, this is where all the magic happens as far as trying to keep traffic flowing efficiently and well throughout the city of Bakersfield. Now, there's another room here in your office there that is. is really interesting. It is. And can you take us to that? I would love to. It's okay. called our Traffic Operations Center. Okay. Let's head back there now. And what exactly is going on here in, in this room? Well, the Traffic Operations Center is... Uh, we uh, have uh, programs in the computers that are connected to all of the city signals. Well, no, I shouldn't say all of them, but at least we have about 420 signals and at least like 380 are connected through the city, through conduit that we've been placing in the roadways and construction projects for the past 20 plus years. 
Uh, anytime there's construction going on, we would lay this in the, in the ground and then we pull fiber or copper wire through and have it bring all those signals here to this brainchild, if you will, the traffic operations center. And this is a map that shows all the signals that are connected to the city. Each one of these little dots is a signal light out there uh, in the city. And if it's green, that means we have good communication from here all the way out to the, all the, way out to the uh, signal light, wherever it is out in the uh, outskirts or even close to downtown here. You can see all the signals that are really congested right down here. Now, in downtown. We, were, we were talking earlier about the, co the different colors mm -hmm. and I was talking about getting here, I had to travel down Rosedale Highway. Right. So I was kind of wondering, hey, am I being detected on Rosedale Highway? What lights am I going through? And then you were pointing out the white. What does that mean with the white? The white, lights? we don't have communication with it at all. The red shows that we have communication with the signal, but it means we've lost communication with the signal. <laughs> That's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, for example, here near the freeway, this is 99. These are Caltrans state signals. So although we have connection with it, we're not in control of it. That's why those stay red all the time. But other places such as this on, I believe that's Ming Avenue, there may be something wrong with that signal out at Ming. Um, if there is blue, that's another alarm that uh, something's wrong with it, but the red means that we've lost communication. That could be a construction project that's going on. Not necessarily always a bad thing, but at least it warns us to let us know we don't have communication. If an emergency vehicle comes through, these lights uh, turn pink. It shows that they're being preempted, you know, a, a, a fire truck or an ambulance or um, police, you know, needs to get through and clear the intersection uh, they have a little strobe light on top of their, their car that triggers this little thing that's on top of the signal light. And it reads it and it knows that an emergency vehicle needs to get through. And uh, it turns the signal green so that they can make it through the intersection. Obviously, when someone's life is in danger, we want to get the emergency first responders there as fast as we can. So you don't and have this helps us do that. The cross traffic. You don't have to sit there waiting yeah. for the light to change. It, it, it preempts it. It turns it green so that the intersection can clear and hopefully prevent Let's, a disaster. Over here, we got yes. cameras going on. Yes, these are connected to these. Uh, the cameras, we have about 30 cameras, not at every location, obviously. We have way more signals. We're adding more as time goes on. That's great. Here's an example of, uh, we, we can see what's going on out there. Um, we're not recording anything, but if there's something, a triggered light, let's say it goes red or something, we can pull up a camera if we have that in the location and see maybe there was a collision out there that took out the box or uh, there was something else that's happening for a flood or something, or maybe it looks like nothing happens and maybe that triggers that something's wrong with the wiring and the, and the, the signal itself. But this uh, gives us an idea of what's going on, behavior uh, with the, at the intersection. Here's something also that's reflecting the same intersection, uh, Stockdale Highway and California Avenue. And these are both in real time. You can see the eastbound through and the eastbound left turn lanes, uh, are, it has a green light right now. So as you saw them, they were turning left and going through still. Now it turned yellow and one of the other directions is going to turn green. Right here, the through south and, and the through right left, there. and there, yeah, they go. there they go. And then they're making the left turn. So now you even can see pedestrians, right? There are. Here's a pedestrian right here. They hit the button, the pedestrian button. Unfortunately, we can't see them on the on the deal there. Um, and they're winding across this way. It looks like. So uh, the signal knows when you press that pedestrian button. There's a pedestrian here, and it usually gives a lot, a little more time for a typical walking pace for somebody to make it across the signal or to make it across the intersection. And Stein Road and Cal, it's a big intersection. It's not like a local road where you're, you live in your neighborhood. It's you know, wider, uh, typically about 90 feet or 110 feet usually. About wow. there, right? Well, there's so. a lot of math required with this, right? So when we come back, we're gonna kind of go over how you determine speed limits, correct? Uh, we will see, yeah, how we can determine a speed of a car, yeah. Awesome, okay, <laughs> and we will be back in a little bit. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We'll go right back to the phones. And Audrey, how are you this afternoon? Good. And you're a sixth grade student, correct? Yes. All right. As soon as you're ready, let's hear the math problem that you're working on today. Okay. If two rational numbers, A and B, are ordered such that A is less than B, then what must be true about the order for their opposite? 
negative A and negative B. Oh, interesting. All right, that sounds good. So we want to be able to compare negative A and negative B. Wow, Audrey, I like this question a lot. Do you have any numbers at all to give us? Because all I hear is letters. Um, I used 1 and 2 for A and B. Oh, so you put some numbers in there. That's a great strategy. I like that strategy a lot. So you chose some numbers so that A and B would work in the first part you told me. A is less than B. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so which one did you put as 1 and which one did you put as 2? A is 1 and B is 2. Okay, that totally makes sense. So 1 is less than 2. There you go. So then it sounds like we need to compare the opposites, right? Yes. Okay, so what would negative A be? Negative 1. Negative 1. And what would negative B be? Negative 2. Negative 2. Now we're going to go compare those things. Do you think that we can compare them just by looking at them or do you want to make a number line so we can see where they are? Um. I want to know if we can make a number line. So that I sounds can good. See where they I are. like that. We did a number line in our last problem, and it seemed to help us out quite a bit. So I'm going to make a number line. Can you tell me the range that we're going to go on this number line? In other words, what is the lowest number that you want on the number line, and what is the highest number? Um, negative five to five. That's a great choice. Any any specific reason that you chose those numbers? Um, they're both. They're higher than negative one and negative two yeah and my teacher told me that we when we're doing a number line we should use opposite i like that that's great so it sounds like that message is getting out loud and clear because we heard that from the last caller as well so we have a number line from negative five to five and i think one of the best strategies is just to put some number put some dots on the on the numbers where these points lie. So you told me at the beginning that a is less than b i'm going to go ahead and put a dot at number one and we say this is A, and a dot at the number 2, and we say this is B, right? Yes. And you can see, hopefully on your number line there, that A is less than B, because A comes before B on the number line. Now what happens when we go and put the opposites on, right? That's the, what, the part that we really want to know. So let's see if we can go down here <coughs> and down to negative 1. We have this one here. This is negative A. And then we have a negative 2 negative B. Hmm. So which one on the number line is bigger now? Remember that arrow has to continue to point the same way. <clears throat> so if I have the arrow going the same direction which it needs to be, it looks to me that from the number line things have switched around, haven't they? The negative A is bigger than the negative B. In other words, negative 1 is bigger than negative 2 because it's further to the right on the number line. So can you repeat the last part of the question? I think there was some kind of conclusion we need to make here. Um, then what must be true about the order for their opposite? Ah, gotcha. So in this specific example, can you tell me what, what must be true? If A is less than B, what happens to negative A and negative B? Which one is bigger there? Negative A is bigger than negative B. That's right. Now, can you tell me what you might do, because we only tried one pair of numbers, right? What would you do with this problem just to maybe try another one? Or can you say that for every single number in the whole world? Um, I think so. Yeah, unless... that's a good question to ask yourself, isn't it? And it's a really kind of a fun mental exercise to have to say, does this really work for every number that we possibly have? So maybe what you want to do this is a wonderful conclusion, at least in this specific example. Maybe try two or three more on your own just to make sure that you come up with the same conclusion. If you start off with numbers and one of them is less than the other one, when you change the signs, the opposite of that happens. If you have opposites of the numbers, you have opposites of the greater than or less than sign. It's probably going to be true, but you might want to try a couple more. Okay. Okay? Good Fantastic question. Thanks for calling. Fantastic problem right there, Audrey. Wonderfully done. And because of that, we will be sending you to the movie of your choice at Maya Cinema. So congratulations on that. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 530. We're going to go to the phones in a couple of moments. But right now, we need to get Dylan to work because you've been sitting here listening to a lot of kids do their problems. We need to make sure you can do some math today. You ready? Yeah. All right. Head on over to the board. We're going to look at your homework assignment paper here. And it says to do a tape diagram, and we're going to go ahead and do that with the first part of your problem here, all right? When someone donated 14 gallons of paint to Rosendale Elementary School, 
the fifth grade decided to use it to paint murals. So we've got 14 gallons. They split the gallons equally among the four classes. So there are four Ooh. classrooms that are going to use four gallons, or 14 gallons. So there's four different classrooms we're going to divide that into, right? So into four classes. Four classes, gotcha, okay. So part A, how much paint did each class have to paint their mural? So let's figure that out first. Any way you can do a tape diagram to get that one going for us? We got a lot of lines I feel lines like this is going to take too long. It is going to take a while. That's exactly right. Now think about this a little bit, right? Tell me a little bit about the tape diagram. What does the whole tape represent? Does it represent? It represents the 14. The 14, gotcha. So we got to have 14 things, right? And we're going to divide them into four different pieces. Mm -hmm. So you think you need a bigger tape? Probably. Okay, let's do that. Let's make a bigger, longer tape here. Okay. So then. And it comes up like that. There you go. Any idea how many how many lines you're going to have to make to 13. make 14 sections? 13. How would you know that? Have you had some experience with this before? Yes. It's always one less, isn't it? Okay, let's see if you can put 13 lines in there. Here we go. I think it's going to work this time. Good. 9, 10, 11, 11 12, 13. All right, so we have this. Hey, we made it. That's exactly right. So here's a tape diagram. We have 14 sections because you got 14, 13 lines. And what are you going to do with this four part? Well, so let's see. Four. Wait, 14, four. Oh, okay. Four can do go into dividing. 14 okay. three times. All right. Two. Yeah. So then it would have two left, but four can't go into two. Right. Yeah, bad deal. So what do we do with that extra two there? Remainder. Okay. Got a remainder. Do you want to put the remainder as an R, or do you want to make it as a fraction? Because mm -hmm. we have this tape diagram, we still got to do something with the remainder, right? Mm hmm Okay. I think I might want to put it as a fraction. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Now, when we look at this tape diagram, what are you going to do with all those boxes? You're going to shade them in? You're going to yep. cross them off? Well, since we have three and remainder two left, uh -huh. three. So you got three of those strips there. There's yep. three. And what about that remainder two part? Have I you ever done that where you make a remainder into a fraction? I've seen it before. You've seen it before. Well, let's go ahead and do it then. If you've seen it before, at least it won't be brand new to you. Yeah. So I really like how you had that two left over. And that's exactly right. You got the two. And we'll make it into a fraction. Any idea what would go on the bottom there? Probably four. That's right, because you divide it by four. And I know you're a pretty smart guy, so before we do anything with the two-fourths, how can you reduce three and two-fourths? You could uh, simplify the fraction. Okay, let's simplify it. What do you get? One Any half. little more room there? One half. One half. All right, so right down here, let's go ahead and, yeah, one half, and keep the three with it as well, okay? okay. Keep the three out in the front. Okay, so you filled in three of these here. How are you going to fill in a half? Show us on your tape diagram. How are you going to fill in a half of one? Fill in half of the tape diagram. There you go. So we'll do half of one right here, huh? Mm -hmm. There you go. Fill in that top part there. There you go. So we have three and a half. Now what do we do? Hold on, let me think. It's a good thought, huh? Yeah, exactly. The theory, according to your math here, is that we should be able to have four equal parts just like that. Yeah. So let's do a little Christmas thing here. Ready? You did one in red. I'm going to do one in green. Here's my half. One, two, three. Right? So we have one classroom that's going to get three and a half, and another classroom is going to get three and a half. Now you do another one. And the other classroom is going to get three and a half. Yeah. So you got half. One, two, three. Let's see if there's three and a half left for that last classroom. One, two, three. Where's the half? There it is right here. No, it's left over there. So we do. We have four full classrooms that get three and a half gallons apiece. I like your division, and we have a great picture that goes along with it. That's a good deal. There you go. Nicely done, guys. We'll go ahead and continue on that problem in just a few moments. But because you've gotten off to a great start, we'll be sending Dylan to Chick-fil-A. Get yourself a nice meal over there. There you go. Everybody's having uh, yeah. to Chick-fil-A. Hey, don't forget, we have phone tutors available until 5.30. We're going to go to the phones right now. And Brian, how are you this afternoon? 
Good. You? I'm wonderful myself. Are you in seventh or eighth grade? Seventh grade. All right. As soon as you're ready, let's hear that math problem. Okay. Jasmine walks three miles each day. Write and solve an equation to find out how many days it will take for Jasmine to walk 75 miles. Uh, okay. Sounds good. So did I hear you correctly? You said she walks three miles each day. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So how do you want to attack this problem? At some point, we want to make it to 75 miles, right? Yeah. Gotcha. Any way that you want to specifically start this problem out? Uh, I don't know, really. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways to do it, huh? Well, let's at least start from the beginning, right? If mm -hmm. you walk three miles a day, right? Yeah. Three miles yeah. on Monday and three miles on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in five total days, how many miles would you go? Okay, so uh, 15 miles. That's it. Yeah, so in five days, we would go 15 miles. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to quite work out so well. No. Nope. Because we'd have to do a whole lot of adding if we wanted to get all the way to 75. Hmm. Yep. Well, let's take what we have here. <clears throat> we have, we added up all these threes and we had 15. So, yep. because we did five days, how, what is a way that we could end up, if we started with 15, like we have a total here, yeah. and we have three miles a day, how do we get back to five? Subtracting. 15 and three. You could do some subtracting, but you just use those numbers, 15 and three. How could you get back to five? What do you think? Uh... 15 times five? No, that'd be too big. 15 minus five? Won't quite 15 work out, right? Divide five. 50, yeah, there you go. 15, and I kind of gave it away there for you. 15 divided by three, that'll get you back to five. So mm -hmm. it looks like this might be the best strategy for you. If you take all the miles that you want to go to, which in your case mm -hmm. is 75, and you divide it by, you're only going to go three miles a day. Mm -hmm. If you can work that part out, you probably figure out how many days it's going to take. Let's do that part together. Ready? Okay. How many times does three go into seven? Four. Oh, a little bit less. We don't want to go over too far. Three go, how many times does three go into seven? Two. Three, that's it. We got two of them, and three times two is six, so we'll subtract that out. Oh, here comes a real familiar number. We just got through doing that. How many times does three go into 15? Five. There you go. That's exactly it. And we don't even have a remainder, which is super nice, so we don't have to worry about making a fraction like in the last one. But that's it, 25 days will get you to 75 miles. Is that a full month? Yes. Even in the shortest month, we have 28 days, right? So we're almost there. Yeah, so we're almost there. Yeah, we're almost there. That's a lot of walking, though. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, so 25 days is what we ended up with. Great question. Thanks for calling. Nicely done, Brian. Congratulations on that. And do remember, we have phone tutors available until 530. For that effort, we will also be sending you to Cubby's. Get yourself pizza at Cubby's Chicago style pizza. We'll be back with more right after this. Today we're at Orangewood Elementary School and today we're here to Today we're at Orangewood Elementary and we're with fourth grader Arian. How are you? Good. All right. You ready to do some math problems? Yeah. All right. Let's take a look over here. You eat pizza? <laughs> yeah. What kind of pizza you eat? Pepperoni. Pepperoni? That's good stuff, isn't it? Ooh, I like pepperoni too. So, let's say that we have four pizzas. Mm -hmm. All right. And each one of those pizzas has eight slices. Mm -hmm. And you, and how many people do you usually have pizza with? Eight. Eight people? Wow. All right. Well, you know what? It's a good thing that all of you ate 21 slices. Whoa. Whoa is correct. I'm going to so, be full. Well, yeah, I imagine you would be after 21. But we're going to have to figure out how many slices are left over. All right? So, first of all, we need to probably figure out how many slices there are. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to do that? Multiply eight, multiply four. So all right. Well, grab the marker and go ahead and get to work.
All right, so what's 32? 32 slices. Or, yeah. 32 slices. And are they all pepperoni? Yeah. Okay, Here, so you I'll write, label it. There you go. Perfect. See, if you label it, it's easier for me to understand. All right. And you ate how many? I ate 21. Okay. So now what do we do? We subtract 21. Well, you subtract 32 and 21. So do I subtract 32 from 21 or do I subtract 21 from 32? 21 from 32. Very good. So let's go ahead and try that. So you have 11 slices left over? Okay. If we have 11 slices left over, do I have a whole pizza left over? No. Well, yeah. Which Wait, is it, no or yeah? Uh, yeah. Okay, so how do you know? Because you are you like telling me, you're guessing, or what are you doing? I because if there's four pizzas and four yeah, minus four, then that's eleven. Wait, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So that's seven. So and then you have seven pizzas. Okay, that's if we had whole pizzas. Yeah. All right. So look. We have 11 slices. How many slices are in one pizza? Eight. So if I have 11 and I take away eight slices, that'll be a whole pizza? So let's say I take away eight slices. That would be a whole pizza, right? Yeah. And how many slices would then be left, be left over? There you go. So you actually have a whole pizza left, don't you? So in case you get hungry later on, right? Like, or you could have it for breakfast. Oh, there you go. Pepperoni pizza for breakfast, huh? Arian, nice work. Of course they see the rock tower when they come in and they get anxious and they want to get on that right away but we have to make sure that they can follow the rules we have to be able to trust them they need to be able to trust themselves <laughs> Today we're seeing an at-risk youth group come out and just explore the Condor Challenge, kind of see how they can be successful in many different ways. Get the ball, get the ball, get the ball. Get the little... We're focusing on communication, leadership, trust, and then we also have introduced consequences. <laughs> Whether or not they're successful just depends on how well they work together. <laughs> what I hope for them is just to learn some team building skills. They don't have any right now. Like this, look. Look. This is definitely going to help them and just develop socially and just learn how to trust in one another. There, now you're good. Walk across now. You're good. going to break. They need this mentally, emotionally. I think it just it'll definitely plant a seed for their future. Good job, guys. Nice reach. The whole point is for them to walk away feeling successful and confident and hopefully they can achieve anything else outside of here by using those same strategies. There you go, nice man, good work. It was scary, honestly nerve wracking. Just concentrate on the log in front of you, not looking down. All the way up and over your shoulders and set it over your shoulders and I will help you. Watch the rope you guys. Make sure you're not, not touching the ground. Safety is always number one here. With our five finger contract it's our smallest little pinky finger but it really represents a very important part of the Condor Challenge. But really what it comes down to is just evaluating each individual participant and not putting them in a situation that they wouldn't be able to overcome. Yeah, nice work. I've seen a few students take leadership roles, work together and push one another. They're not putting each other down like they would back at home. Here they're building each other up and encouraging one another, which is spectacular.
All right, you never know what you'll find out at Com. That, as well as the uh, holiday lights, as well as all of the animals out there on a regular basis. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30. Dylan from Stockdale is working. We need to get busy on your homework. Yes. Back to the board, young man. Here we go. Let's do it. So now we have four students. So you can go ahead and put that number four up there if you think you're going to need it. And they have a 30-square-foot wall. Whoa. How many square feet of the wall will be painted by each of the students? So you have 30 square feet. Wow, uh -huh. I messed up. That's all right. So 30 square feet, and they're going to paint it, huh? And there are four of them. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to do with this? Tape diagram. Ah, tape diagram. Yeah, I might need some more. Nice space. small one. <laughs> what are you going to draw here? Are you drawing 30 pieces or are you drawing four pieces? 30. Whoa. They're going to be thin there. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be a little bit thin. I think we might need to go a little bit bigger there. Maybe. Man, that's a whole bunch of them. Well, how about this? We certainly can draw a tape diagram. Maybe we can do a little bit of that tape diagram after you tell me about the math. What is the ultimate math we're going to do here? Mostly tape diagrams. Okay, but tell me about the math. Is it addition, subtraction, multiplication, division? Oh, it could be anything. Like, it could be anything, that's right. But most like, tape diagrams, at least according to our last one, what do we do with that problem? What adding, you, like adding, subtracting fractions. Mm -hmm. And what did you have when you had a remainder in that part? Turn it into a fraction. Yeah, we did turn it into a fraction. And which operation is a fraction? Dang it, what was it? Well, it's not addition, right? You're not going to add those numbers. So no. if you have like 8 over 2 mm -hmm. and you want to change this, Simplification. Right? It's you simplify, right. But what do you do when you simplify this one? 8 over 2 is what? It's a mixed number. It is, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so what do you do with, to make this into a whole number? You told me earlier, right? It's this yeah. top number. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. What do you think? Which one? Uh, divide. It is divide. Yeah, that's it. And the way that I remember that is because division has a big line in there, and so does this one. Kind of like two dots right there, right? So the same thing is kind of happening on this problem here. At least we can think about the math a little bit. We have 30 square feet, right? And we have to divide that amongst four different people. Can we do the math part first, and then we can maybe draw a little picture that goes okay. with it? Otherwise, we'll be drawing lots of lines. I like this tape diagram, but it could take a while. Just right underneath, we can even make the tape diagram when we get done, if you want. Okay. Just right underneath here, can you do that? your 30 divided by 4? There you go. Good. Okay, so let's see what happens here. I'm going to give you a little more room and see what happens when you divide 30 by 4. Oh, I see what you did there. Tell me a little bit about what, what number is this? Is this a 7? 7. Okay. Does 4 go into 3 7 times? It, it doesn't, huh? It can't go into it. Yeah, it doesn't. So that really would be a 0, right? 4 goes into 37 times, right? So when that happens, just make sure you put your 7 over top of the 30 and not just the 3, okay? I like your 7 there. Good. We have a little bit left over. Let's see if you remember from the last problem. What are you going to do with that remainder? Turn into a fraction. Okay, let's do it. You got 7. And then... The remainder goes on top. Two fourths. That's it. Can you simplify that fraction? Yeah, seven and a half. So back to our tape diagram. <clears throat> There's going to be four separate groups, and mm -hmm. how many, how many slices or how many pieces are going to be in each group? Seven and a half. Seven and a half, right? So <clears throat> let's say that that is seven, right? And we're going to have a little thing in the middle here, and we're going to have a half. There you go, good. And let's say that we have another seven right here. And, that's and there's your half, good. And let's say that we have another seven right here. And we'll go ahead and divide it up in half. And another seven right here. And this is their half. There it is, right? So certainly you could draw out all those lines, and not, that's not a good time. But it would be a pretty long tape diagram, right? Yeah. The great thing about a tape diagram is knowing that it's a division problem, and you have the division to back up your work that's right here. So you can show, someone says, really, I can't quite see how those lines are up the seven and a half in each group. They're so skinny. I say, well, look at the math. I promise you it actually works. So I like that problem a lot. Did we answer the question, Mike? Indeed we did. And right now we're gonna continue moving on. We're gonna go out and about, finish up with Mary Lou. Today we are at the Public Works Traffic Division and I am again here with Ed Murphy, Civil Engineer 3. Hello. 
and we were talking about we're in the control center and we could see all the traffic lights that are going on and what intersections that have cameras and see all that from that um, you can kind of um, take information about determining things that's going on in the street yes right? such as the speed of cars that are driving on they're getting a typical speed profile of the the cars that are driving on a typical roadway and I could show you how we do that right okay. over here first off we have these uh, probably seen them out on the side of the road or these this hose going across the road connected to this uh, we use it for counting cars but we also show use it for determining speed which I'll show you here in a minute and uh, these are laid out uh, they take a pre air pressure in the end and every time a car drives over it sends the information into this box <laughs> and then we download it into the computer when we bring it back here in the office See, whenever I drive over those, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to be in trouble here. No, you're not in trouble. We're uh, just trying to gather data to get an idea of what's going on out there so it could help better serve you and every other driver and pedestrian and bicycle rider out there in the city. So here's a little stick figure sketch of two intersections in the roadway between them. And here's the little box that we would lay. We'd chain it to a tree or a sign or something like that. Please don't steal our boxes or our hoses. And... Uh, <laughs> lay the hoses out across the roadway at uh, we're typically 10 feet a, a apart. Now, where does the math come in? We're trying to figure out the speed. We know the distance between the two hoses, and as the car drives over it, it hits the first hose and then it hits the second hose, and there's the amount of time difference between it. We know the difference of the distance over the distance of time, and the change in distance over time is the speed. And that's what we get. So let's say we have three cars that drive over, over this. And uh, the first car drives over it, and by the time it hits the first, first uh, uh, wire and the second, the second one, the time was 0.273 seconds. That seems pretty fast, and it is. It's almost like swimming in the Olympics. It goes down to that, because if the cars are driving like 30 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, it's, you know, boom, boom. You feel it as you go over the hoses. So we know the distance between them is 10 feet, and the time it takes to go through it is 0.273 seconds crunches out to 36.67 feet per second. But in units that we use in traffic engineering is miles per hour, at least in the United States, that's how we typically do speed. So we want to convert that from feet per second into miles per hour. So for the, uh, for the distance, one mile is 5280 feet, and then there's 3600 seconds in one hour. We multiply that through, the feet cancel out, the seconds cancel out, we end up with miles per hour and we get 24.78, which is about 25 miles per hour. Same thing with the car number two. We, uh, let's say they drove over it at 0 0.170 seconds. That crunches through into 40 miles per hour. And you, what, you know, whatever the time is between the two, uh, between the two uh, hoses, uh, that's how we determine the speed. And then we can add those up, all the speeds up, and divide it by, you know, to get the mean or the average speed, add all the speeds up and then divide it by the number of cars in our sample. For this case, we only have three cars. We add all three of the speeds up, divide by three. The average speed is 40 miles per hour. So you know that maybe that an average speed to set for that street would be possibly 40 miles per hour. Yeah, we use a different, for, for setting the speed limit, we use a formula similar to the mean. It's called the 85th percentile. It's a little more complicated. I don't think we have the time to get into it now. But that would be 85% of the cars, vehicles surveyed, are traveling at that set speed or less. And you kind of have something. Sure. In this case, we don't put the hoses out when we do this day. We use a radar gun. And unlike police out there trying to give you a ticket, we're not trying to do that. <laughs> I'm just trying to get, like I said, we hide in the bushes so you don't even know we're doing it. And uh, we take a sample, in this case, uh, we took 105 cars, typically 100, because it keeps it an even number, but let's complicate things right now, right? So 85% uh, of those cars is about, uh, what did we say, 981, it was like, it's about 90, 89 or something like that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 89 cars. So here we see, as we add them up from the bottom up, like I said, it's 85% or lower. Uh, you know, one car was going 40 miles an hour, we got two cars going 42 miles an hour. We keep adding them up and somewhere 89 is somewhere between here, between 54 and 52. So the 85th percentile speed is about 53 miles per hour. 
to set the speed limit, we always round up. And that would make the speed limit. This is the computerized program that does all the crunching through, does a few more extra calculations, and we set the speed limit at 55 miles per hour. Now, like you said, it's not you guys who are really setting it. It's the public, the right? Drivers, yeah. Like I said, we want somebody, we take the, like the first car of a platoon or just went the comfortable speed of them driving on the roadway. And of course, laws come into play. Near a school zone, it's 25 miles per hour. In a residential area, maximum speed is 25 miles per hour. You know, there's in maximum speed in California, I think on freeways is 60. You know, there's other set laws that we have to obtain, uh, observe, but local roadways, arterials, collectors, could be anywhere from 25 miles per hour to 55 typically yeah. on the faster arterials. Yeah. Now, what schooling did you need? for this profession? I am a civil engineer. I got my bachelor's degree in civil engineering and uh, that was years ago. <laughs> Lots of math. Um, I also like to say in addition to math, also just writing skills and, and uh, social sciences. I mean, you need to know the technical part right here, but then you also need to communicate it to your boss and to other people in the public and relate to others. So, you know, a lot of technical writing classes and things don't neglect those, but certainly, paying attention, a lot of attention to the math. And it may, your efforts are not in vain. <laughs> you, are, you are spending quality time working these problems. Because later in life, when I took physics, I remember in college, it was, uh, then I really saw how the math made the physics so much easier. And it really made sense, and it really came to life. And it really, yeah, it was really exciting. It's cross-curricular is what it is. It is, it is. And, uh, but it was a tool, it was a language that helped explain what was going on. And nowadays, I look up a lot of things in a book, a formula in a book, but uh, I have that background training and my mind's been trained on how to think critically, you think mathematically and apply that to what we're doing here today. So it may seem a lot of simple math we've done, but I put in the time, trust lot. me. <laughs> There's a lot. But very enjoyable, a lot of fun. Any, anyone can do it if you work hard enough. It took me a while. I'm not the smartest guy in the book, but uh, absolutely. And it's a lot of fun. I've, this has been a good, this has been a good choice of vocation. Thank you again, Ed, for letting us come today to um, visit the uh, Public Works Traffic Division. Yes. And all the new technology and everything going on here has been absolutely amazing. And being able to see all the cars and the intersections and how your maps work with all of your signals. Mm -hmm. Truly amazing. And here's a little yes, something thank you. to thank, you know, cool. thank you for letting us visit today. And so we are going to head back to the studio. Thanks for that, Mary Lou, another supporter of Do The Math. A lot of things behind the scenes right there with traffic and what's going on. Yeah. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We have Dylan in studio, and we're going to continue with the next problem that you're working on, because while we were taking that little break, we had you finish up that other side, all right? So head on over to the board, and we'll work on problem number two. Many parts to every problem, so this is yeah. nice. Problem number two. Craig bought a three-foot-long baguette, so three feet long, and made four equally sized sandwiches with it. Equally. So, part A, what portion of the baguette was used for each one of those? Wow. Hmm. Any idea how we're gonna do this one? Tape diagram. Ah, oh, tape diagram. All right, I'm gonna draw you a three foot baguette that's gonna look a lot like a rectangle. <laughs> okay, so we'll say that this thing is three feet long. What do you want to do with that thing? So you want to divide it up into feet first? Yeah. Okay, so here we go. You told me I'm going to do one less. So that's one foot, and that's one foot, and that's one foot. One, one, and one. All right, so now we got to split that into four equal parts. Mm -hmm. Oh, what are you going to do with that? So it's three feet long if I get. Mm-hmm. So... It's either that way or it's the other way. It's either that way or the other way, huh? Yeah, it's kind of hard to figure out. Well, here's the thing. Think about, the, think about how this problem goes down, right? This is a three-foot piece, and we're going to divide it by four into four pieces, right? Yeah. yeah. So do you want to switch those numbers around? Yep. Okay. So we'll see what the math looks like, and then we can maybe draw a picture that goes along with it. Okay. And then it can't go into it. It can't even go. So what are we going to do with that? Can you make this into some kind of thing? Maybe we were using, we were using fractions earlier, right? Yeah. Can you make this into a fraction? Yeah. What is that? Three-fourths. Oh, three-fourths. 
So the question said, what part of the whole entire piece of bread is each sandwich, right? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you answered that, but we need to draw it. Yeah. Okay. So the first one's going to be not so bad, right? You got mm -hmm. three fourths. Go ahead and draw. What is three fourths of one? Where would that line up? That would be three Now you just four. drew three whole pieces, right? We don't have that much. We got to go backwards on that one. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can take those away. We just want this piece right here. Okay, what happens if I had four, four sections of that one? Can you fill in three of them? One, two, three, right? And we have four sections of this one. Can you fill in three more? One, two, three, good. And we have four sections of this one. One, two, three, you have four sections. One, two, three, good. So we've made three sandwiches. And how many pieces do we have left? We have three. We've got three pieces left, so we can make another sandwich. It's a total of four, right? And each of them has one. Three sections, right? So three fourths of a foot would be each individual sandwich. Mm -hmm. I think that answered that question. Do we have a second part to that one, Mike? Well, you know what? We're going to stop on that right now. So come on over, Dylan, because you have done some outstanding work yes. right there. I like what you And did I want to ask you, so in class, it seems like you guys are doing a lot with the tape diagrams right yeah. now. So is this the first time you're doing problems like this, or have you used something besides tape diagrams before? We've been only doing tape diagrams. My teacher really wants us to learn tape diagrams. All right. And how long have you been doing these now? Three weeks. So a couple of weeks. So yeah. you're feeling pretty comfortable with the tape diagram. Yeah. All right. And do you think there are some other ways to say, to solve the problems? I don't know. There probably are, but there probably are, but I probably don't know them. Well, you know what? That's the beautiful thing about math is because there are so many different ways that you can solve problems. Yeah. And the good thing about the tape diagrams is that you have something visual that you can re represent the problem with. So it makes a little sense when you look at it and kind of logically you're looking at it going, yeah, that's reasonable if I have this three feet, you know, of whatever it is and I need to cut it into four equal pieces, yeah. what will that be? So nice work on that today, and I'm sure that you helped out a lot of other students that were kind of struggling with those same kinds of problems, but using a tape diagram probably helped them out. Yeah. I need you to help me out now, all right? Because every time a student phones in to do the math, their name gets entered into a drawing, and we give them two tickets to any CSTB athletic event of their choice. So I need you to reach in there and pull out one of the names from the students that phoned in today and see who our winner is. Audrey Bill Williams. All right, there we go. So congratulations to Audrey, phoned in with one of the math problems. And Audrey from Bill L. Williams, sixth grade student, if I do recall, will be going to a CSB athletic event of her choice. Do remember, we have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon, as we do most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Southern California Gas Company, California Resources Corporation, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.
Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron. The Kern County Superintendent of Schools. Southern California Gas Company. California Resources Corporation. Kern Schools Federal Credit Union. Panama Buena Vista Union School District. Bakersfield City School District. And the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Scott. And on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon, if you happen to be doing some math and you need some help, give us a call. We can help you out. The number here in Bakersfield is 636-4357. If you're in San Luis Obispo, you can also call us. The number is toll free, 866-636-6284. You can even email us your math question if you have one. Do the math at kern.org. Please watch the show if you get a chance. Do the math online.net. And if you have social media, you are welcome to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. And it's funny because there are a lot of students that have lived in Kern County and then moved somewhere else yeah. and will still view the program viewing it online. Right. Uh, the, we've had some calls from other states, as a matter of fact, uh, in the middle of the country and as far, I mean, all the way across the country from New York. And mm -hmm. they, uh, I know that yesterday, uh, this is going to send out a shout out to Mikos who was viewing the program in New York yesterday. Nice. So there you 7 o'clock their time, 4 o'clock ours, right. not too late, so you can still watch the program. Math and, has uh, no time constraint, right? Get a little math right there. Yeah. Anyway, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. We'll go out and about with Mary Lou later on. We have a very special guest in the studio. But before we get to all of that, let's first take a look at today's Math in the News. So this morning, were you up early enough to see the uh, super blue blood moon and it all was a, that? Yeah, it was a really interesting moon this morning. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, were chatting about that yesterday on Math in the News. And uh, So are you a collector of anything? You know what? I actually used to collect coins until someone happened to stop by my home when I wasn't there. And I no longer have a coin collection, which oh. is unfortunate. But well, I used to collect Hopefully it wasn't coins worth a lot at the right. time. Uh, maybe right. you were a young lad. And yep. Yeah, the coins were important to you. They were, yeah, they were important to me. But, That's right. Yeah. I think a lot of kids, you know, collect coins at some point. Sure. Uh, you know, rare coins, even coins from different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that a lot of kids uh, used to collect the quarters, you know, just from the different states. Right. Because you know, I mean, there are all those different cents, designs. That's different, right. Di different yeah. things on there. Uh, so here's a coin I think you might find interesting. If you see one of these, let me know and I'll give you a nickel oh, for it. Oh, awfully nice of you. All right, so here we go. <laughs> this is uh, America's first penny. So the first coin ever minted by the United States pursuant to the Constitution. The coin doesn't say, if you look at it, in God we trust or e pluribus unum. Doesn't have any of that on there. Instead it says, mind your business, down at the bottom of it. Now in 1735, Benjamin Franklin published the first issue of Poor Richard's Almanac. One of the uh, sayings he had in there were, three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, that would as definitely well make as it many easy. others, okay. Right. Um, but on the same side as mind your business, so we'll look at the other side, but this is the one side, mind your business is the word fugio, Latin for I fly. Now many historians believe that this combined with the photo of the sun above a sundial, former rebus, the sundial signifies time, and with the word meaning time flies. Time flies, mind your business. Somebody opening a company, mm. sage advice right there to, right. Uh, to give that sure. right there. Okay, So that's the one side. We go to the other side, and you can see that we have the 13 chains interlocked for the 13 colonies. Right. And then the saying, we are one. Mm-hmm with the United States right there. So anyway, a little bit of history with uh, America's first penny. So then I was like, all right, well, how do we tie a little math into this? Because we could always do currency and things like that. Right. Um, 
but we'll take a look at how pennies were made and how many are made and things like that. Okay. So they used to be 100% copper. And right. if you have any of those, bring those in also and I'll give you a dime for them. Oh, heck of a deal. All right. Yeah, the deals get better and they better. They do, I can tell. On, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, today's pennies are about 95% zinc with a copper coating about the uh, thickness of cellophane tape mm -hmm. on top of them. Approximately 30 million pennies per day are produced. And since the beginning, the U.S. Mint has produced more than 280 billion pennies, circled the earth 137 times, Jeez. laid them out. And uh, we can see the diameter of it and things like that. So I was like, all right, cool, those are some facts and things like that, but not much that a kid could do with the pennies. So we'll go ahead and throw this one in there at the end. So can you move just three pennies and flip this triangle upside down? Ooh. So think about the three pennies. You can only move three pennies. All right, and you want the triangle to be upside down because right now we have one, two, three, and four. All right, so in yeah. every row, so there's one in this row, two in this row, three in this row, and four in this row. So we want it to be so it's four, three, two, one. Right. So you can only move three of the pennies and flip that upside down. So do you have any idea? Um. I think that might take a while. That's a good challenge for us there. Indeed like it that. is. You know what? Yeah. We'll ask our expert who's in studio with us right now. We have Justin in studio. How are you today? Good. You know what? Before we put you on the spot, why don't we let everybody know who you are, actually. <laughs> by, why don't you let them know where you go to school and what grade you're in? I'm in sixth grade, and I go to McAuliffe Elementary. All right. So at McAuliffe Explorer, correct? Yes. All right. So you've never seen this, I don't think, until right now. Um, do you have any idea how we could move three pennies to make this a four on top, three, two, and then one? No. All right. Well, you know what? We're going to give you guys the answer right here <laughs> okay. because we only have so many minutes to do right. this. Uh, but here challenge. we go. So we're going to take two off the bottom, all right, and we're going to put them all the way up all here. All right. All right. So this now will have four, all right? This one will have three. This has two because these two on the outside have been moved up, yeah. and the top one comes all the way down. So there we now have our four, four three, three, two, two one. And, one. and only moving three. And only moving three. Right. And those were the stipulations, and nicely done right there, boys. We uh, have taken a look at the first penny, and that is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530. We have Justin in studio, and I know that you've been working on a lot of things in sixth grade as far as math. And before you came in or on the show, we were talking about what you like most about sixth grade. And I think you were telling one of the ladies that you like math the most. Is there a reason for that, or is it just because it comes easy to you, or you like it, or what's, what's up with the math thing? I like it because it's challenging sometimes. Oh, there you mm. go. So challenging. So you're doing something, I know, that you brought in a book today that's not your regular sixth grade math book, right? Because you're able to do that pretty easily right now yes so it's always fun to kind of like extend yourself and right. see what other kinds of things you can do now I know that you've been working on simplifying expressions earlier in the year but what I'd like you to do is work with Scott on one right now because we've got a couple of moments before we head out to Mary Lou and for students that are just learning this how you would go about solving it all right all right all right head on over to the board and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look and we're going to solve number nine we're going to simplify this problem so in parentheses and you can probably start all the way over on the left side of the board. It would probably yeah, be we'll easier. So we have negative A minus 2B, close parentheses, and we'll put a negative symbol and then open parentheses again, minus 3A plus B, and close parentheses. And if you would simplify that, please. Ah, uh, we've got to make it simple. So what are you thinking? So first I'm going to take away the parentheses. Oh, you want to make the parentheses go away. Okay. So in the first group, can you just drop them? Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, where'd that come from? Well, since there's nothing in between, I put one between the negative sign and the parentheses. Good idea. I like that a lot. Because then you know that there's a one out there. Okay. And now the sign just changed on the 3A. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Since there's a negative and you're multiplying by each one in the parentheses, a negative times a negative is a positive. Okay, so we're using the distributed property here, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just do a little bit of uh, 
show here as to what's going on so we can see where that's coming from. So the negative one got multiplied times negative three and you get a positive three, that's good. Negative one got multiplied by positive b and you get a negative b. Can you tell me, is there was no number here and you put a one, is there a number, I don't see a number here in front of the a, what would you, what can you put there? A one. Okay, so there's a one there and then can you do the same thing with the b over there at the, at the very end? Yes. Okay, so at least we know what number goes there, it makes it a little easier at the end, right? Okay, I'll give you a little more room here, what do you want to do next? I'm going to combine the a's and the b's. Okay. Good deal. And I really like what you did here because you, uh, you signified that some terms you can combine, right? A's go together so they get an underline. B's go together so they get a circle and you put them all together. Now, in my experience, one of the most commonly missed math problems is this problem right here. Negative two minus one. Can you tell me a little bit about in your head, how did you come up with negative three? I got negative three by taking negative two. So say you owe someone two dollars uh -huh. and then you owe them one more. If you add them together, you owe them three dollars. That's a really good way to think about it. I like that a lot. Maybe I can use that as well. So that's a good job on making it negative three. The two is okay to be positive. How did that end up being positive? Because we had a negative to start with. So like, in, let's say you owe someone one dollar. Okay. Someone gives you three dollars. Now uh, you can pay them and you'll have two dollars left. I like how you think about that. So if you had to put a sign in front of the two A, what would it be? Positive. Wonderful. Now you want to put all the A's and B's together at the end? No. No. We have apples and bananas, and we're going to go ahead and leave them separate. Nice work on that. I like your analogy for the money. Nicely done, guys. And don't erase anything yet. What I'd like you to do, Justin, is tell me if, so go ahead and on the side, write down 2A minus B. And why would a student come up with that answer? What would they have had to have done to get that answer? Instead of at, instead of adding negative two and negative one together to get negative three, they added plus one to negative two, which gives negative one. Mm -hmm. negative and that's two. often what students do. They'll look at that and they'll say, hey, I have two minus one. I only have one left, but it's that negative in front. And that analogy you used about owing someone two and owing someone one more dollar, now we owe those, that person three dollars. I think that's a good way to think about that, putting those two numbers together, even though they're both negative. Nice job. Yeah, well done right there. And I like how you circled the sign with yeah. the terms right there right. to remember that they are both negative. All right. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 530. We'll get to the phones. But first, let's go out and about with Mary Lou. live today with Logic Films and I have with me Kevin Turner and Orion Martindale. Hello gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Can you let everybody know what your part is with the, this business? Yeah, uh, as you said, my name is Kevin uh, Turner and I'm the CEO of the company um, and I basically run a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff that goes on with it and work in the creative side. <laughs> and my name is Orion Martindale and I am the Chief Operations Officer and I do a lot of the creative stuff and also a lot of the logistics before the shooting happens. And then on the day of the shoot, I do a lot of organizing of the crew. Okay, so you obviously just got this going, right? Uh, yes, I mean, just in the last year, we've been working on it for a while, but as far as like putting the team together and whatnot, yeah, we just got this going and we've just released something. How, lo uh, how did this come about? How did Logic Films come about? It started with uh, myself and another of our team members named Kyle Tyner, who is the, um, the other co-owner. So I own the company as well as uh, Kyle. And we're writers. And so we, uh, we, I went to him and said, hey, let's start up this, uh, this film company. I mean, it really was as simple as that. And um, it started out because we both wrote something together. We had a good connection and a chemistry. And around March, I would say, of last year, we kind of started the process and got all the paperwork and everything in and then started, started working together and so, met Ryan along the way. <laughs> so how did you guys start grabbing your crew, though? How did you find members like, like Orion? How did you find your crew? So, 
Well, a lot of that was word of mouth and kind of happenstance because I actually moved up here from Los Angeles after working years in the television industry, and I was trying to switch careers into teaching, and some through a six degrees of separation that said, go talk to Kevin, he's a teacher. <laughs> yeah, was... And we sat down and then spent the rest of the time talking about television and making webisodes and everything like that. So that just kept rolling and it's like, yeah, I want to help out with the web series, so let's do that. And then it really became, somebody else was like, I want to do that, and somebody else was, I want to do that as well. So, Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of word of mouth to begin with, yeah. but, before I fall over here. Uh, and then a lot of people were just interested, and some of them were interested in the story, some of them were interested in being just a part of the filmmaking process, and some of them were friends that we had. That, uh, one of our other execs is uh, just an old friend of mine that I Word, so. so your main is with the writing, correct? Yeah, yes, in the creative side, yes. Okay, and Orion, yours is again with... A lot of logistics. What, is, the, what does that mean? In the sense of like getting ready to shoot the actual day of shooting, we, Kevin and I have to sit down and say, here's the whole shot list, here's all the things we're going to shoot for the day to get this one episode done. And then we break it down into individual shots and individual scenes. If we're going to shoot in the kitchen, we have to do this many angles. And if we then move into the living room, we have to shoot that many angles. So that's kind of the stuff that I sit down with Kevin and we work out what's really going to happen on the day of the shoot. And then we create a schedule out of that. And then on the day of the shoot, I'm standing there with the schedule to make sure that we're getting the ball rolling and everything is happening on the schedule. So obviously, you have to be extremely organized yes. and kind of like an outline. Mm -hmm. um, from that. So you um, went ahead and started filming, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. When did that start again? Uh, August. We started, I mean, pre-production happened months before. So I think we started the actual process of getting Honestly Ever After, which is our first uh, web series out there, right around June, maybe, May. So, yeah. We started having casting calls and uh, getting our crew. And then we started filming in August and filmed all the way until December. So just kind of here and there getting little And you have shoots. two episodes out, correct? Yeah. Or two are out now and one more this Sunday. And how long does it take to film just one episode? Depends on the episode. Our first one took a day. It's about a six minute episode. The other ones, about 15, 20 minutes, those took about three different shoots. And so it's many hours. So not only with the shoots though, but once you're done, do uh -huh. you need to go back to the technical part of it, to the editing and all that? Yes, the, the post-production part is taken a, a, right up until release. We're tweaking little things here and there. And so it takes a lot. How long does that take? How long normally with post-production? Post -production? Few, a couple months, maybe. Um, depending again, depending on wow. the episode. It's yeah. longer than the actual filming. It is. Oh yeah, yeah. The actual filming is the shortest part of everything. Yeah. Pre-production and post-production are by far the longest part of this process. Okay, so when we come back, you're actually going to show us how you use math mm -hmm. with Logic Films. Yes. Yes. Okay, so we're going to head back to the studio. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou. 636-4357 is the phone number. We have Justin in studio. We're going to give him a break right now. We're going to get to work with Brian. How are you this afternoon? Hello, Brian. Hello. Are you in seventh or eighth grade? Seventh grader. All right. As soon as you're ready, let's hear the math problem that you're working on today. Okay. John wants to buy a video game and a movie. The video game costs forty-two dollars, and the total cost is sixty-five. Write and solve an equation to find out how much the movie costs. Okay, so Brian, just to make sure that we're clear, you said the video game cost $42, is that right? 43. Oh, 43, I'm glad I asked. $43, okay. And what else are we buying? A movie. Ah, uh, okay. And how much does the movie cost? Does it tell us? No, it doesn't, it doesn't tell us. Ah, that's what we want to find then, huh? What's the total cost again? Is it 65? That's what I wrote down. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So we have to write an equation and we have to write, uh, be able to come up with how much the movie costs. So those are the two things you're looking for, is that right? Yep. Okay, now I've written something, but I'm curious about what would you write if you started this question? Uh, at the end, I'd put equals 65. Yeah, that's good, because you're gonna add them all up together and it's gonna equal 65. Yeah. Good start, okay, that's what I have too, so I agree. Then you'll put the 43 at the beginning, so it's gonna be 43 plus something equals 65. Yeah, something. That's exactly right. We don't know what it is, plus something. So what do you want to put in that space for the something that we don't know? Uh, put an M to represent movie. I like that. That's a wonderful choice. 
because a lot of times we'll always revert to X, but in this case we'll do an M because we know it's a movie. Okay, so yep. what I have written here, it sounds like is exactly what you were thinking. 43 plus M equals 65. What do you want to do with this little equation that we've written? Oh, usually what my teacher does, she puts a line in between the equal. Uh, okay, to kind of sep usually... separate one side from the other? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea too, I like that. And she usually does reverse, so instead of adding, you subtract from both sides. Okay, so do you want to subtract M or do you want to subtract 43? 43. I gotcha. Okay, I think that's probably a good idea because we want to put those dollars together with the dollars on the other side. So you said subtract 43 on one side and then mm -hmm. what about the other side? Uh, 65 minus 43. Oh, okay, so we have to do the same thing over here. And that makes sense because this equal sign says that minus 43 has to be the same as minus 43 here. Well, from what you told me here, that goes away. The 43 minus 43 is just gone, but we still have this M left over. So have you done the math here yet, Brian? What's 65 minus 43? Uh, two. Five minus three is two. And what about six minus four? 22. Yep, there you go. Now let's see, let's make sure at least this makes sense, right? You bought mm -hmm. a video game for $43. You bought a movie for $22. Would that add up to a total of 65? So if you went back over here and did a little checking on your answer, you can yeah, take this answer right here and put it all the way back in the beginning. So you, you just checked it for us and it does equal 65, is that right? Yes. Good, okay, so there's your check. And we always like to see that at the very end just to make sure that we did it right. Did that mm -hmm. answer all your questions? Yeah. Good work, nice job. And if you have more questions, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. Video game, movie, a lot of fun, but not nearly as much fun as going to any athletic event of your choice out at California State University, Bakersfield. Thank you to CSUB Athletics for providing Brian, as well as many other students, a couple of tickets to the activity of their choice at any athletic event. All right, young man, you rested? Yes. Time for you to get back to work. All right, head on back over there. So we'll start over on the left-hand side if one of you guys wants to write down, these down and then you can go ahead and start working on it. So our first equation is 6x plus 5y is equal to negative 3. Our next one is 3x minus 2y is equal to 12. Okay, so when you see a problem like this, what are we supposed to do? What are we looking for? What is the end result supposed to be? Make it so the number between the, so we can find out x and y. Ah, uh, there you go. So I'm glad you said that. So the goal is to figure out what is x and what is y. That's really what we want to find out, right? And I think that we need to make sure we understand, right, that we have two equations because if you have an x and a y in one equation, you can't find out what either one of them is, right? Okay, so we have a goal, x and y, and so you were just about to tell me that we're going to make some numbers the same, is that right? Yes. Okay, which ones do you want to make the same? Three and six. Gotcha. How did you choose those? Since, it's, since they're both positive, it's easy to make them equal. Okay, gotcha. You're going to make them exactly the same? Yes. Okay, and what happens when they're exactly the same? When they're exactly the same, you can subtract one equation from the other to find either X or Y. Okay, let's do it. That sounds good. So you want to keep the top one the same? Or are you going to change both of them? I'm going to change both of them. Okay. Six, let's see. Okay, so you just changed the numbers? Yes. How'd you do that? I mean, obviously you have an eraser, but you just changed some numbers on us. So, since it was 3, I multiplied it to be 6 to get 18. Mm -hmm. And so I multiplied 6 by 3 to get 18. Gotcha. So the two are equal. And one of those rules in math is, just like on the last problem, if you do it to one side, you have to, you do, do, it to it do it to the other side, other. right? So it looked to me like this used to be 6, right? And you multiplied times 3. That was yes. a good idea. But if you do that, you got to multiply it everything in that problem times three, right? Everything. So it's going to be five times three, and it's going to be negative three times three. So we don't want to forget that part. Now, what did you multiply the bottom part by? Six. Okay.
So this used to be a 3. We multiplied times 6. So we'll have to multiply that number times 6. And we'll have to multiply that number times 6. We're going to have some big numbers here, but I think it's going to work. Boy, we're going to make a really different problem here, aren't we? You going to remember what all these numbers are? Yes. Okay. Even I don't remember all the numbers, so I'm glad you do. He has a younger mind than we do. That helps. <laughs> Seventy-two, good. That was times six. Okay. And what was that one? I forgot. Oh, okay. man. Put you on the spot. Good thing we have the original problem written down. What was that? Down at the bottom, that was negative two. It used to be negative, negative two, two, so what is it now? Negative Twelve. two. Okay. So you've done a lot of manipulation with these different equations, and you got these two things the same. Now, the goal is to, to get, get x, x and y, right? Yes. So in this process of getting these two things the same, what are you trying to do? I'm going to subtract one equation from the other. Okay, and what will happen to the, the x's in this case? The x's will cancel each other out. Good, okay, so when they go away, the nice part about that is we can solve y, right? We can figure out what y is. Okay, I'm gonna do a little thing here for you just so we don't forget, right? We are subtracting this whole thing, would you agree? Yes. So 18 minus 18? Is zero. Ah, that's nice, okay. So that's zero, nothing there. What about 15 minus negative 12? 27. Ah, I like it. So what happened to the negative part? Since you're subtracting a negative, uh -huh. it's almost like you're taking away debt. Cause ah, okay. So you would have more money. So we have, a, we have a positive number there, right? 27y. Okay. And the last part we're going to do here, negative 9 minus 72. Gotcha. Now tell me about that a little bit. You got negative 9 minus 72. How'd that come about? Since you're subtracting a positive number from a negative number, I added 9 and 72 together and Good. got 81. All right. And I like that last problem that we did too where we had an equal sign in the middle and we put a big old line there. So I think that kind of helps. Don't forget that negative sign. Okay, so we have 27y minus 81. This looks like something we can finally get down to it and find one of the things that was our goal at the beginning, which was find an x and find a y. Looks like you're going to find a Y here. What's your last step? I'm going to divide both sides by 27. Okay. Ah, checking it out. You had a pretty good idea what it was going to be, huh? Gotcha. Now let's look back up here, right? 81 divided by 27 is 3. I agree with you there. What's negative 81 divided by 27? Negative ah, three. there you go. All right, so we're halfway there, right? All that fun work, and we're halfway there. You tell me here that this is negative three. How are we going to find the x? By putting negative three into one of the equations. Man, it'd be nice to have those original equations. Huh? We'd have a lot smaller numbers, but they're gone, so you got to work with what you got. Which one are you going to use? This one. Okay, top one there. So you're going to put, oh, 18x stays the same. All right. So what's happening is you're taking this number here, right? And you're going to plug it in right there. I think that's a good choice. So you're going to do a little math on your own there and change it up. Okay, so 3 times 15, 45. And then what's on the other side? That doesn't change at all. Okay, so now you got two steps. Off you go. Okay. Good. Aha, uh -huh. so we got another one of those situations where we got a negative number and a positive number, right? And you're going to subtract. Good call. Okay, so it looks like on the left-hand side, what do we have left over here? 18x. Okay, don't forget that part. Good job. And we got 36. Now, is the 36 a positive or a negative number? Positive. Positive. And how'd you know that for sure? Since the larger number is positive, it's ah, going to have that. I side. like the way you think. That's wonderful. The larger number is positive, 
So the answer is positive. Okay, so we got one more step here. 36 divided by 18. Uh, you had a pretty good idea that it was going to be a 2, huh? Nice job. Uh-oh. <laughs> Almost. So we got a 2. All right, let's go back up here. And we have a 2. So apparently, according to what you've done here so far, x equals 2 and y equals negative 3. Now, if you put 2 in for x and negative 3 in for y in the first equation, we're pretty sure it would work because we already tried it. What if you put it in the second equation? Would it work? Yes. What about one of those equations that was at the beginning of the problem? Yes, it would still work. I don't know if I believe you. We've got to try it. Let's go way back to the beginning of this problem and look and see what we had for the, pr for the uh, equation. What was the very first equation there, Mike? So we have 3x, 3x minus 2y minus 2y is equal to 12. Equal 12. So we're going to take this original equation that no longer exists on all your work, right? It's all gone. We're going to take this one, and I want you to just plug in 2 for x, negative 3 for y, both at the same time, and see if we get 12. Teamwork. Okay, tell me a little bit about what you did here. So we have 3, we plug the 2 in there. So that's times, right? Yes. So you got a 6, good. What about negative 2 and you ended up with 6? What did you multiply that by? Negative 3. Gotcha. And you got 6 plus 6 equals 12. That's a good check to have. If you were going to write your final answer here, one way that we wrote it was x equals 2 and y equals 3. What's another way you could write the answer to this problem since we have an x and a y? That's a really good way to write it. So really what it represents at the end of the problem is a point. Now here's the question of the day. If it represents a point just like that, tell me about that point. Why is it important for us to get that point with two equations? What's that point represent? The point represents a dot on a coordinate plane. That's exactly right. It does represent a dot, but not just any dot. It's a really specific dot, right? What specific dot is it that has to do with these two equations? 2, negative 3. It is 2, negative 3. Now tell me about this. What is this? If you were going to put this thing on a coordinate plane, what would it look like? Would it look like a square? No. Would it look like a triangle? No. What would it look like? A point. It would not quite look like a point. Think about that. Think about a bunch of points together. How about that? If you had a bunch of points together and you connected them, what would you have? A line. You would have a line. So this represents a line. What about this thing? It looks pretty similar. It would be a line. It would well. also be a line, yeah. And guess what? Those two lines, if you were going to put them on a graph, they would touch each other like a big X. You want to take a wild guess about what that point is right there? Two negative. Ah, that's a good guess. That's exactly right. So the whole point of this problem is we have one line, we have another line, and we want to know where do they cross? Where do they cross? So what we did was we used a whole bunch of algebra. You did a wonderful job on that. And you found out where they cross without even making a graph. Nice job. Well done. Well done indeed. And for us doing such a great problem right there, we have a uh, ticket to go see the Bakersfield Condors for you right there, Justin. So congratulations on that. Hey, we'll be checking in with Mary Lou and getting to some other phone calls. We'll do all of that right after this. Today we're at Orangewood Elementary School and today we're here to Today we're at Orangewood Elementary School and I've got Abigail, a fourth grade student. How are you today? Good. You ready to go? Mm-hmm. All right. Do you like to read books a lot? Mm -hmm. What kind of books do you like to read? Do you have favorite ones? Harry Potter. You like the Harry Potter books? Those take a little while, don't they? Yeah. Or do you go pretty fast through them? Have you read all of them? Mm -hmm. How many are there? Mm, there's about seven. Seven? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have you read 37 books a month. You think you could read 37 Harry Potter books in a month? No. That'd be pretty good, difficult, isn't it? You'd be spending all day doing that, right? But anyway, you're going to read 37 books a month. And we're going to start 
back in when you started school, September of 2017, and you're going to go all the way to January of 2019, because we're in 2018, right, coming up. So, first of all, how do you think we're going to solve the problem? By multiplying. By multiplying. By multiplying what? Books. Books, right, 37 books per month. So we need to know what else? What else do we need to know? How many months? How many months, right? So from here to there, we need to figure out how many months. So how do you, how do we figure that out? How about we start with September, right? So let's start with September. What's next? October, November, December, January. Okay, so let's stop there because we got to January, right? Okay, so if we read 37 here, in October, we read another 37, right? And then you said what comes next? December. November, November. and December, right? And then what? And then January. And that's a new year, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to go January here, okay? And how many months do we have in 2017 that we've going to be reading books? Four. Okay, so here, you know what? You get to work. You're the star of the show. You get busy writing. Okay. All right, so let's put a four over here so we know there are four months for 2017. Now, do we need to, so why don't you go ahead and put 2018 up at the top of there. All right, and do we need to list all of the months, or do you already know how many there are? I already know how many there are. How many? Twelve. Okay, so let's put 12 there. All right, and then we need to go to 2019, right? So let's put 2019 up at the top of the other one. And for how many months will we read then? For one. One. Okay, so how many months altogether will you be reading books? 17. 17. And how did you get to 17? Because there's some students out there going, all right, I see what you're doing, but how did you get 17? By adding 4 plus 1 and then adding that to 12. Right. So you go 4 plus 1 is 5 plus the 12 is 17. All right. So we have 17 months that we've been reading books. So let's go ahead and we'll put 17 months. And the question still is, how many books will you read during the entire time? So what do we do next? We multiply 37 by 17. Okay, so you can go ahead and do that. And as you're multiplying, I know you're probably doing it in your head, but if you could say it out loud for those of the students that are just learning how to do this. 7 times 7 equals 49. You put the 9 down, and then you bring the 4. 3 times... So you went 7 times 7, so now we're going to go 7 times 3. 7 times 3 equals 21. So you put... And then you add the 4. Which equals 6. Whoa, hold on. 21 plus 4. Oh. 21 plus 4 equals 25. Right. So we'll put the 5 and then put the 2 right next to it. Good. And let's cross out the 4 since we've already used it. So now... We're not multiplying by the ones anymore, so do you know what to put under the nine now? You can put a zero or an X as a placeholder. Good. So now we're going to multiply by the tens. So what's one times seven? Seven. Okay, and where does that go? Perfect. And then what? So we did one times seven, so now we have to go one times? Three. Three, and what is that? times 3 equals 3. Good. So now what do we do with those numbers? We add them. Perfect. All right. So draw your line, add them up. Almost. So you went 12 plus 3, right, to get 15? Okay. Which is understandable. When you went 7 plus 5, you got 12, right? And you put the 2 and you carried the 1. So the 1 is going to go up on top of the 2 like that, like this did. So now what's 3? Good. Now add these up going down that column. 
There you go. So how many books is that all together? 629. Over how many months? Over 17 months. There you go. Abigail, that is a lot of reading, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Good work. All right, just a reminder, if you're in San Luis Obispo County and we do one of your math problems on air, you'll automatically receive ice cream from Doc Bernstein's Ice Cream Lab. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We have Justin working out some fabulous math problems this afternoon. But right now, we're going to go out and about with Mary Lou once again. We are live today with Logic Films, and I am with Orion Martindale, COO of Logic Films. Thank you. And you're going to kind of go into telling us what it takes to film a scene, right. correct? Yeah. So basically, the web series that we do has about 10 to 15 minutes for each episode, and we break it down by scene. This scene takes place in the living room of our couple. We're played by our two actors, Darren and Mariah. So long before we get on to the actual shoot day, we ask ourselves, what do we want this to look like? And then would we decide, in the end, we want a wide shot, then we're going to want a close-up of Darren, and then we're going to want a close-up of Mariah. And these are basically the three shots that we go between for this scene. So knowing that we're going to have three shots in this one scene, we have to ask ourselves, how much time are we going to have to actually get that accomplished? So basically, we'll sit down and draw out a basically rough sketch of what the actual uh, location is going to be like because first we'll have we'll know that there's going to be a couch because Kevin will sit down and decide that Darren will be on a couch and then Mariah will come in from over here and stand here. Darren will sit on the couch and then we have to ask ourselves where are we going to shoot all of this so the first thing we're going to have is a wide shot so we'll do a camera sketch that direction and this basically covers all of this area with both of them in the scene. And then we're going to move the camera over here. And then we're going to basically just get Mariah. And then we'll have another camera over, camera setup. Not another camera, but another camera setup. So do you just normally have Darren. three cameras set up, or do you move the cameras according to? We move one camera. Um, unless we have two cameras, then sometimes we can put a camera here and here and have both actors just keep going and shoot two at the same time. But we usually work with one camera, so we'll do the wide shot and the actors will go through the whole scene once, and then we'll stop and we'll move the camera over here, make sure the lighting is correct, and then just have the, this actress go through the whole scene, and then we'll come over here and shoot it a third time from this direction. So knowing that we're going to have to actually do the whole scene three times, we know that the scene is probably about two minutes long of talking, so it's going to be at least six minutes just shooting. And then we have to think about how long does it take to set up this camera, and then the lights around the characters, because we have to make sure that we can see them and get just the right lighting going on. And you actually have brought your lights, yep. correct? These are area lights. We have um, This is set up on a, a C-stand, and basically this light can generate, is this a 650? That's a 1K. That's a that's our big one, and this is the it's a three foot six. That's the 650. So that puts out less light than the 1K, and knowing that we have to determine which one is going to be used in this scene. Because if we're in a small living room like this, a 1K will probably blow it out too much. So we want to move the cam the light away from the actual actors, or use a smaller light for a scene that's in a room like this. Okay, now, Kevin, I'm going to ask you about math. How, how can you incorporate math into filming? Well, one of the things that the problem that I'm going to show you has to do with just the logistics of planning all this. So as Orion was talking about, it's all about planning and budgeting your time because you've only got a certain amount of time uh, to use for, uh, for the actual shoot. So, to go over here, sorry. <laughs> um, what, a typical shoot for us might be anywhere from 10 to 12 hours uh, in a day. So let's just say, for example, it's 12 hours. So we've got a 12-hour day. And uh, in that 12-hour day, there are three other outside um, 
forces that we're going to need to deal with. First of all is a lunch break of an hour, set up for an hour, and tear down for an hour. So the problem that we have to ask ourselves is in a given day with those three hours that we know we have to deal with, how much time does each shot, uh, or how much do we have to budget for each shot? So my hypothetical that I have here is if we had 27 shots, and we had a 12 hour day, so I said one hour for lunch, one hour for, uh, what was the other one, uh, to set up, and one hour for tear down. How much do we, or how many minutes do we budget for each shot? So in this particular uh, problem, obviously what you would do is you would start out with how much time do we actually have for filming? So you would take your 12 hour day, and then of course subtract this to get nine hours. So we have nine hours of actual footage uh, to shoot. And then we want to transfer nine hours, of course, into minutes. So you correct so, me here for no, with all the terminology. Okay. We have to make sure because yeah, obviously there's sixty uh -huh. minutes in an hour. Right. So you got sixty minutes in an hour times nine, which is five forty. Five forty. So we have five forty minutes, five hundred and forty minutes that we have to do this. Uh, do this entire shoot. With 27 shots, we have to divide. So we have 27 going into 540, which comes out to 20? Yep. So uh, you want me to actually do the math? Oh, yeah. okay, 20. okay, 20. <laughs> so you would come out to uh, 20 minutes. So in this, you would have 20 minutes per shot. Now that's rough. Obviously, some shots are going to take longer than others, but at least it gives us a general idea for how long we have for uh, for each shot. It's a little bit of a... It's, everything sounds so organized. You have to make sure you're just so organized and on top of things. Absolutely. And then when things kind of, I mean, everything on set, sometimes things go wrong or sometimes things happen. So we got to be flexible. So there's a lot of organization. Okay. So we have a lot more when we come back. And so we're going to send it back to you guys at the studio. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou. Uh, when you least expect it, expect it when these things kind of happen, especially yep. with live TV, which makes it all that much more fun. All right, Justin, we've got time for you to do one more problem. You ready? Ready. All right, head on over to the board. I'll go ahead and read it so the uh, kids at home can play along. Maria has 60 toys and Alex has 40 toys. So I guess you so can just abbreviate, you know, Emma has 60 and Alex has 40. Alex has 40, okay. All right, they each gave Jane the same amount of toys. Mm. Alex's new amount of toys is greater than or equal to one half of Maria's new amount of toys. Wow. So they each gave Jane the same amount. Alex's new amount is greater than or equal to. So writing down that sign. So here we go. How about this? Do you know how much they gave? No. Okay. So what do we do in math if we don't know something? We put a variable in its face. Gotcha. So what do you think, what kind of variable do you want to use for the same amount that they gave? X. Okay, gotcha. So let's make an expression for Alex, right? Currently, Alex has 40. Now we want to know how much Alex has left, right? Right. So if you start with 40, what do you do with this X that you're talking about? If you gave something away? You subtract it from 40. Gotcha. 40 minus X. Good deal. And then we also have Right, giving the same, starting with 60, what do you do with that X as well? Yes, okay, check. so now let's go back to this part that Mike thinks is really important, which I agree with him. It really is important. We need to put a sign between these two, and it sounds to me like it's not going to be an equal sign. Okay, it's going to be something else to it. All right, so can you read that one more time, please? Here we go. Alex's new amount of toys is greater than or equal to ah. one half of Maria's new amount of toys. Oh, I really like how you put the parentheses around there because we want to make sure it's half of the whole new total, right? Okay, so we have an inequality to solve here. We do have a bit of an equal sign on the bottom, but mostly we wanted to make sure we got the greater than part in there as well. Where do you want to start? The one half. Okay, the one half. Let's go. What do you want to do with the one half? Okay. I'm going to get rid of the parentheses by multiplying by each of these. Okay, good idea. Good. So this one half times 60, half of 60 is 30. And you still have one half X over here, just so we know we haven't changed any of that stuff yet, right? Okay, give you a little more room. What's next? Now I'm gonna bring 
30 over here. Okay, good idea. And by bringing it over, you have to actually do the opposite of what it says, right? You gotta subtract it from that side, that goes away. And subtract it from that side, good. So we're making this thing a little smaller now. 10 minus x greater than or equal to negative 1 half x. So far so good, we're gonna need some more room, but it's looking pretty fun. What's next? Now I'm gonna bring the x to the other side. Okay, good idea. And so that says minus x, right? And you're doing the opposite just like you did before. Plus x, gotcha. I like how you did that there. Now what number goes in front of the x here? Because you didn't have any number there. Oh, you're gonna go with a one, okay, gotcha. Because if there's no number, we'll put a one. So this problem really is negative one half plus one and your result is? 10 is greater than or equal to 1 half of x. Right, now tell me about the sign on this 1 half, because that sign was negative. This one will be positive. Okay, gotcha. All right, we're gonna extend this a little bit to give you a little more room, and see what you're gonna do with this part. Looks like we're almost done. We really wanna get that x part there, right? So now I'm going to div divide each by 1 half to get rid of. Okay, divide by 1 half, I like that. Mmm, I see you thinking there. Dividing by one half is always an interesting process, right? Here's a little more room for you. So what's, oh, I like what you did there, that's great. How did you know that 10 divided by one half is 20? Because a lot of people would just say five. Since you're dividing by one half and you're dividing by fraction, you actually you're actually multiplying instead of dividing. Yeah. And the opposite of one, if you switch the numerator and denominator, you get two. Uh -huh. 10 times two is 20. Gotcha. So 10 divided by two would be five, but 10 divided by a half is 20. Okay, so we have this expression here at the end. It says 20 is greater than or equal to x. You could also write that as x less than or equal to 20, right? As long as that arrow is still pointing to x. So both those things mean the same thing. But what does that really mean? Let's go back up here and see what that means, right? <clears throat> we have Alex's new total, Marie's new total. It says x is less than or equal to 20, right? Yes. So can it be 20? Can yes. you put a 20 in there? Could be 20. Could it be less than 20? Could it be 19? No. Well, let's see if, it, if this, you put this in here, right? Wait, yes. Is 19 less than or equal to 20? Yes. Good. Could, you be, could it be 10? Yes. Sure. Could it be 5? Yes. Yeah, it could be. We have lots of choices there. And because there's so many choices, that's why we had to use an inequality sign, because we have a range of choices. Now, here's a question for you. Could you, could you give away negative things? No. No, that wouldn't really work so well. So if we had to have a range of things, right, we'd probably want to go between 0 and 20, because we don't want to go into the negative range. But we can give up to 20. I like the work you did there, really well done. Right. There you go, nicely done, gentlemen. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We've got one more opportunity to head out and about with Mary Lou. I am live today with Kevin Turner, CEO, and Orion Martindale, COO of Logic Films. And we have been talking a whole bunch about what you guys do mm -hmm. and what's behind a scene and we even saw our math problem on how math is related mm -hmm. but how can kids get involved and how did you get involved well we actually took very different approaches and paths to getting involved in in working with film uh, I personally did not go to film school I'm actually a teacher um, uh, here <laughs> and uh, with you <laughs> uh, but I um, just was always a passion for me so I just kind of taught myself and um, read books and watched tutorials online and everything I could just to gather information. Orion, I'll let you talk about yours, but it was a little bit more classically. Yeah, well after high school I went to film school and I did that for about two years and then went into the industry and I worked a lot in reality TV mostly because that became the big thing at that time and then a little bit in production of like scripted television or feature films and stuff like that. So I worked in Orlando, Florida, and I also worked in Los Angeles for a few years. But uh, if kids want to get involved, though, you're, you know, 
your phone has a camera on it that can record a very high quality video these days so you can start shooting short films uh, which is how a lot of filmmakers get started as kids just shooting short films with their friends yeah every director every big time director now has a reel of their like first film that they've ever done and it's always just this kind of cheesy looking thing but you learn and you grow the best way to learn how to do something is to do it so just get out there and, and start shooting and then obviously there's so much on the web I'm sure like you said right, that's right. how you learned mm -hmm. is simply by looking on the web and looking things uh, you know looking things up mm -hmm. and I know there's what iMovie mm -hmm. that yeah, the kids can yeah. kind of like probably like play download with, and yeah. play around with and yeah. all that so because we're doing talking math what skills in math do you think they would need? I would say obviously the organization aspect of math and just learning how to you know prioritize and making sure that you're I don't know that you're putting problem solving. Problem problem solving. Solving. Oh yeah all the time. It's constant problem solving especially like in production in, on a reality TV show you have to think about you are going to work for about you know three months at a time and you have to calculate the days that you shoot and who's coming with you and how many people are on the crew so estimating how many people you're going to need and doing all the logistics ahead of time is absolutely crucial because you have to you can't you can't plan everything on set you have to actually do it ahead of time or you're going to waste a lot of time and a lot of uh, and nothing's going to come out high quality and then you've got like more specific things like focus polling, which you actually you measure uh, where the actor is, and you've got to like time everything out. So you use a lot of measurements and a lot of uh, technical things in order to pull focus and. Yeah. So this, it just sounds like there's so much behind it. When we see a scene or something, we're just watching a movie, we don't really realize right. how much is behind it. Mm -hmm. And thank you today, you guys have like shown us how much time and effort it does take to get it. You know, to just get a simple seen out. Well, I want to thank you guys both. We have a little tile. Oh, Do the math you. tile. And again, thank you for taking the time today and showing us everything with your with Logic Films and the best to you guys. And when is your third episode coming out? This Sunday. You can watch it at we have the, I don't know if you can see that from there, but LogicFilmCompany.com. You can watch it there or our YouTube channel at Logic Film Company. And uh, every Sunday at 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, thank you again, gentlemen. And that's it for today. And we're going to send you guys back to the studio. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou. You know what? A lot of fun making films, and as they were talking about, a lot of students and uh, young adults making their own films on their phones. A lot of things you can do mm -hmm. with data technology right now. And a lot of students have fun when we come out and visit them. We do a little math in their class. If you would like do the math to come out to your class, and maybe we do a little bit of math in yours, all you have to do is give us a call. The phone numbers are at the bottom of your screen periodically throughout the program. Also, we send out plenty of stickers and uh, other information to schools and things like that. So if you need some more stickers at your school, uh, just like the one on the camera right here, you can simply let us know and we'll send more out to you. If you need some uh, binder dividers, posters, anything at all like that, simply give us a call. We will send those out to you. In studio, we had Justin working today. And now you're a repeat guest because you were on last year in fifth grade and you're on again in sixth grade. So which was more fun, working last year or this year? I think this year. This year? Okay. Well, I was going to say maybe last year because, you know, it's fun, the first time you did it and <laughs> things like that. So what made it different this year? The problems were more challenging. There you go. The problems you. were more challenging. And that's what you kind of were talking about earlier, right? How you enjoy math right now. And when you get into junior high, you'll be even doing more. And when you get into high school, even more. And beyond that, guess what? Even more. Even more. Even there more. you go. You know what? Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Southern California Gas Company, California Resources Corporation, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education.
with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. <laughs>